I, began, I read a book that was entitled Starting Over. Starting Over. And got me to thinking about how, how needed and how healthy it is to draw new lines in the sands of life and to call that your, your new starting line. This is where life begins. And you begin this, this, this brand new way of thinking, brand new way of living. And so I felt directed to use some of the, this book as a basis and foundation to speak a seven-part series on moving past regrets, because regrets uh, are part of life that we all experience from time to time. So I began this, this series and titled it Starting Over, or Start Over Here. You'll see these banners all over the church this morning. They also mean that you can start over here in a ministry. You can start over here in a brand new commitment in this fall. You can start over here in a brand new vision. You can start over here with a new attitude. Start over here with new direction. Start over here right in this church. The church is a good place to start over. And so let's take off from the starting point together. Last Sunday was about regrets and the sorry cycle that we often find ourselves in. Around and around and around we go with regret. Today, part two is about loving your regrets. So Father, I pray this morning that by the power of your Holy Spirit, that God, as you settle down upon each one of us this morning, that you'd speak and that you'd be clear. And God, that we would never again be the same because all of us face regrets. And God, this morning, we're going to talk about loving your regrets, how to make the best out of the regrets. So God, I pray for the power of your Holy Spirit as I speak this morning. Amen. The flickering fire cast light upon the faces of the little group warming themselves around its flames in the still pre-dawn hours. They were waiting in the high priest's courtyard while Cyphus, inside his house, carried out an unusual overnight interrogation of a prisoner, the troublesome Galilean rabbi, Jesus. Peter was among the group around that fire, trying to hide from the others. How nervous he felt. He wanted to see what would become of Jesus, but he didn't want to get arrested himself and suffer the same fate that he feared his master was headed for. Twice already, he denied accusations from people around the fire that he was one of Jesus' group. Despite those self-serving lies, however, he could still feel suspicious glances. Finally, some rough-looking men emerged from a doorway shoving the prisoner in front of them. There's the Galilean, commented a man who had joined the group beside, from, beside the fire for a short time earlier. Yes, yeah, said another. And do you know what? This guy was with him. I'm sure of it. He has that Galilean accent. Peter muttered an oath and then exploded. I don't know what you're talking about. Peter would have said a lot more, but just then he heard a sound. It was the raspy gargle of a rooster crowing. With that sound, the realization came to him in a sudden rush. He remembered the conversation at dinner the night before. The disciples had been arguing over who was the most loyal to Jesus and who was the most deserving of a place of privilege by his side. Peter had boasted, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison, even to death with you if need be. Jesus had replied, Peter, before the rooster crows in the morning, you will deny me three times. Peter hadn't believed it at the time, but now he realized he had done what Jesus said he would do. He had denied Jesus exactly three times. Almost against his will, he turned to look at Jesus, standing nearby in the courtyard. Jesus gazed back at him, staring deep into his eyes, the look was filled with sorrow and love. Yet to Peter, it felt like a spear piercing his soul. Hmm. And isn't that the way it is with our regrets? As we think about the wrong we have done, 
It pierces right into the inner core of our being. Our being. And it's almost like, like a knife that is in there, and, and it's turning and turning as we groan and we moan, facing the regrets. Jesus had done so much for Peter. And now here's Peter saying, I don't even know the man. As Jesus faced his most desperate hour, here's Peter, and he's acting like a coward. Peter lied. Peter was unfaithful. Peter threw in the towel. Peter weighed in with the anti-Jesus movement. And then he ran from the courtyard, and he wept, sobbing, as he stumbled out into the dark. So the question is, what would Peter do with his regret? What would Peter do with his mistakes that he made? We'll talk about that later, but right now, let me ask you, what will you do with your regrets? What will you do? Around and around and around and around the story cycle doesn't help, does it? Because we tried that. It doesn't work. It's tiring and it's useless. I'll never forget a lesson that, that John Maxwell taught many, many years ago, and it was on failure. And he, in his message, in this particular lesson, he said, failure does not have to be fatal. And he went on to talk about failing forward. When you fail, not if you fail, but when you fail, make sure that you fail forward. And so I've often remembered those words, Gary, when you fail, fail forward. And for me, falling forward is five feet, six inches forward gain. Forward movement. It hurts me when you laugh like that. I said that last week. But it's better than a negative. It's better than falling backwards and losing five feet, six inches on a good day. It's better than losing ground. Fail forward. So you can learn to love your regrets in terms of what it can teach you. I mean, you can have a regret re-entry into the joy of living, into the joy of being productive, into the joy of healthy self-esteem. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 to 11, Paul compares godly sorrow to worldly sorrow. And Paul had to write to them, and it pained him to have to correct the Corinthians. But they accepted this, and they were sorry. And Paul said, I'm so happy that you have repented. Sorrow led to repentance. It was not worldly sorrow, like being, oh, I'm so sorry that I got caught. Paul said, worldly sorrow brings death but it was godly sorrow. Verse 10 says, this repentance leads to salvation and leaves no regret. Verse 11 says, it produced in you. I love that. It produced in you. This gave them a new start in life, gave them a new day, a new twinkle in their eyes. They didn't get swept in the sorry cycle over and over and round and round they go, but rather into re-entry forward. It was movement, territory, future. So regret can be very, very good for us. It buries to resurrect us. It hurts so there can be healing. It sinks so there can be a rising. It knocks down so there can be a standing up. In fact, you can come up the other side taller, wiser, better, Healthier. Yeah. Catherine Schultz, here's what she said. Regret doesn't remind us that we did badly. It reminds us that we know that we can do better. It's a matter of perspective. It's making lemonade out of lemons. It's called Romans 8 and 28, working in your life. And we know that all things work together for good. To them who love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. This is one thing 
all believers should know very well that all things work together for good, including regrets. If we let go and let God and change our mindset, it can produce in you and I. Not take away, not a minus, but it can produce marvelous things. Now, the story cycle is nothing but negative feedback. It's like a church sound system has gone bad. Ever been there? Ever heard that? And it just kind of gets that feedback, and it squeals and yells, and you go from church having sore ears. Negative feedback. I remember one time when I was pretty young, my friend and I, we got these lady firecrackers. They're lady firecrackers are a little bit longer than normal ones. About that long, I guess. That long? No. That long? Not long. We went to this culvert under the highway, and we said, let's light them off, see how loud they'll be. Young, dumb, dumb move, dumb Nova Scotians. So we go under the culvert, and we light them off. We both come out. <laughs> ringing, 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 ringing. That's why I can't hear my wife now when she talks. I use that as my excuse. That's why I can't hear you. I have, I have problems from that, that culvert. But regrets don't have to produce negative feedback and painful ears. What if? Now, what if? That's a big word, isn't it? Combination of words. What if you look and take control of your regrets instead of them controlling you? What if you demanded from your regrets that they provide you with useful, profitable information? What if you shocked your regrets by interrogating them. And what if you chose to squeeze the poison right out of them and filled them with that nice, gooey center of donuts, the feeling, mm, yummy, yum, yum, yum. What if you chose and said, I'm going to squeeze the poison right out of you, regret, and I'm going to fill you up with that nice donut filling. I had one of those that Friday morning. Went to a business and business, and they said, oh, I don't know, this must be donut day. People are bringing in donuts. There was three big trays of donuts. Help yourself, and so I did. And then I had to run home and get some Tums. Because it landed like, whoonk. Every take, every take a big bite of a donut and whoonk. Oh, that landed hard. But what if you just fill it up with nice filling? You may say, well, I can't do that. I can't interrogate my regrets. I can't squeeze the poison out of my regrets. I can't do that. You might say that that's, that seems too weird. Oh, speaking of weird, I was in a Starbucks about a month ago in Minot, having coffee, of course. There was a man sitting beside me. And he noticed that outside the Starbucks restaurant, coffee shop, that there was lots of people and lots of dogs and water dishes beside tables. And people were bringing their dogs, and as they had their coffee, their dogs was drinking water, and it was over 30 degrees Celsius, very hot. And he looked at that, and I, I heard him say to the staff, what's going on around here? What's going on? You got dogs, you got Water? Oh, she said, that's what we do here. We, we provide water for the dogs. And Well, he stood it for a while, and then and he stood up, and then he looked at me, and he said, I don't know what's going on around here, but it's, that is messing with my weird meter. Oh, I never heard that before. I wanted to say to him, you're messing with my weird meter right now. I didn't say that. I've never heard that, so I use it all the time now. Use it on, to my wife. She's getting tired of it. You're messing with my weird meter right now. And some of you might say, this is too weird. I can't do that with my regrets. How do I take control of my regrets? How do I squeeze the poison out? Sounds too weird. Of course it sounds weird. Of course it's unusual. Because it is unusual. It is abnormal. Every new territory seems weird. Every brand new thing you've tried seems weird. Every vision you've gone for seems weird at first. It's normal for it to feel abnormal. <laughs> of course it's weird. It's new territory. The prodigal son, Luke chapter 15, 11 to 31. 
squandered his savings on riotous living. He came to his senses while in the pig barn watching the pigs eating better than he was. And he said, something is wrong with this picture. He had enough of the smell and the muck and the slop and the filth. He had enough of the association with swine. His starving turned into a hunger for a better way to live. And so he failed forward. His regret turned into re-entry. His regret turned into coming to his senses, a going forward to home. His father, the Bible says, if you know the story, was waiting. He was looking and waiting for his son to come home with wide open arms, just the same as God is waiting for us to come to our senses at times, to deal with regret. They say, I'm going to fail forward. I'm going to go to the arms of Jesus. I'm going to hang on to him. I'm going to let him bring good out of this. I, I have some land. Speaking of weird, I have some land in Chemne, and, and there's a low area on this property, and, the, and in this low area, the moles are having, the moles are having a heyday. They're tunneling, and they're working, and they're bringing up lovely cultivated black soil to the top. And every time I go to mow the lawn, I take a rake with me, and I rake that beautiful topsoil that's been given to me free of charge. And every time I do that, I say, this low area is starting to build itself up. You may say, that's weird. Yeah, it is a little bit. Messing with your weird meter now. It's called making moles work for me. They're working for me. I'm getting fresh topsoil. You may say, well, it's all going to cave in someday too. Quit thinking negative. They're tunneling and bringing it up and building up the property. It's called turning things around and making them work for your good, whether it feels weird or not. It's worth it. If you're stuck in the cycle of regret, maybe it's because you're looking for the bad instead of the good. Maybe it's because you're listening to the irritating negative feedback instead of soothing the soothing, peaceful sounds of music. Sounds like a movie. Maybe it's because you're listening to that dark, evil presence, you know, on one shoulder. He's got a pitchfork in his hand, instead of maybe listening to the glorious white wings of an angel on the other shoulder. Change your feedback. Change your thinking. Change your words. Whether it feels weird or not, change it. Change your outlook, and you will change your future. Amen, Gary. Preach it, Gary. I agree with you, Gary. Where did that voice come from? <laughs> I just got a text message. Sorry, you guys. It's very important. It's from the Apostle Paul. Doesn't he know that I'm busy? But it's from the Apostle Paul. Here's what he says. He says, read Philippians chapter, I think it's in three, yeah. Philippians chapter three, verses 13 to 17. Read my words. Okay. I'll do that. Thank you for the Apostle Paul. Chapter 3, he's told me to read verses 13 to 17. Where is it? It's not my Bible. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I like that, Paul. I like what you told me to read. I like it a lot. One time Paul persecuted believers. One time Paul cast his vote of approval to kill Christians. One time Paul tried to stop the spread and advancement of the church. One time Paul was anti-gospel. And wonderful awakening came to the apostle Paul. Acts chapter 9, on the way to Damascus to persecute Christians. The light began to shine. 
He was transformed on the spot. You know something? The Apostle Paul could have lived his life in regret. Couldn't he have? Ever thought about it? Paul did some bad stuff. His name was Saul back then. Bad stuff. He could have kept that going over, that record playing, that CD playing in his mind over and over again. Look what I did. I cast my vote to persecute and to kill Christians. He could have said, I can't get it out of my head. But he didn't. He failed forward. Paul failed forward. Paul became the greatest church planter of all time. You see, what can happen to someone who, who is caught in regret and has had a terrible past? As Paul. Paul became a great supporter of the church. He said, I want to move. I want to push the church forward. I want to encourage the church. I want to see people saved and healed and transformed. I want to see the church explode. That's what became of Paul. <laughs> he became the greatest missionary of all time. When he could have been stuck in the sorry cycle for the rest of the days of his life. He chose not to. He chose to amount to do something great and victorious for God instead of doing something bleak and defeating for the enemy. He said, I'm going to turn it around. I used to persecute the church. Now I'm going to be a preacher in the church. Mm -hmm. Wow. Paul was like you and me. That's what I like about this. Paul was like you and me. We had choices like he had choices, and he, he talked about, in Romans, about the, his fight with the enemy, his fight with flesh, but he had choices just like you and, you and I do. And why can't we be Paul? Why can't we be like Paul? Why can't we make regrets, turn them around to something good and be positive out of it? Why can't we transform not just our lives, but the future and the church? Why can't we just get behind ministry and push it forward. Why can't we be transformed? The good news is you can. All it takes is what? Choice. And it may seem weird because it is weird. If you've been living for 20 years in regret and you start tomorrow changing it, it will be weird and it'll mess with your weird meter. I love that. How many got wind of that already? Make a choice. Hmm. And so with a broken heart, Paul writes to the brothers and sisters in the church in Galatia. They were slipping. I'm going to read to you a bit of that. Galatians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. And he said to them, he said, Formerly when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods, but now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? No! How is it that you're living in a way that's contrary to what this word says? No! Stand up and say, no, I'm not going to allow it. Paul always knew that it could have happened to him. That's what made Paul great, because he was aware of the gravity and the pull of the past, but he was more aware of the power of Christ. It was Christ that lives in him. He said in Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. <laughs> he also said in Romans 1, verse 16, I'm not ashamed. Of, how could I ever be ashamed of the gospel? It is the power of God to everyone who believes. 
Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19. It says, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly uh, realms. That same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that flows in our lives. Isn't that incredible? It blows my mind. Messes with my weird meter. You got it, you got it, you got it. <laughs> Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the presence, on this present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything of the church, for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Now, I know I'm doing it reverse, but let's go back now to verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. I pray that your eyes, that was his intro into what, he just, what I just read. I pray that your eyes will be opened, he says, that you would know the hope. Everyone needs hope. And I pray that you'll see that that same power can be present within you. Huh. I like it. I like it. One of the last words that Paul said to the Ephesian church was, chapter 6, verse 10, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Oh, be strong in the Lord. Don't be strong in yourself because then you'll fall and you'll fail and you'll fumble and you'll roam around in regret. But he says, finally, be strong in the Lord. And in his mighty power. Okay, so we started with Peter. And we heard about his failure. So let's end with Peter. I said earlier, what would Peter do? That's a pretty, pretty harsh thing he did. I don't know how anyone gets over that in the norm, in the normal setting, in physically, on your own strength. Crushed by regret. Denied that he knew Jesus three times. Was there any hope for Peter? What would happen to him? Well, this story has a remarkable, redemptive ending, a wonderful story of starting over. Now we shoot ahead to Jesus has gone to the cross. He suffered, he bled, and he died. He's resurrected, he's alive. And then we go to John chapter 21. This is life on the other side of the tomb. Peter's out fishing. He said, I'm going fishing. With the other disciples, all they caught was nothing. <laughs> In the morning, they hear a voice calling from shore, friends. Haven't you any fish? <laughs> he already knew. The reply was, no. No fish to spurn. That's the Eastern talk. They be skis to spurn, by. <laughs> My dad, I, I won't go in there. <laughs> I won't go there. Maybe some other day. And so they said, throw your net. Jesus said, Throw your net on the other side. So, okay, they threw the net on the other side. You know, if you know the story, they caught so much fish, they could hardly haul it into the boat. The boat. So in the boat, John said to Peter, it's the Lord. It's the Lord. You know, some when Peter heard that it was the Lord, he was in the water. He was swimming for Jesus. He saw him on the shore. In fact, the Bible says he out swam the boat. The boat turned, headed for the shore. Peter says, I can go faster swimming than you can. So he's on in the water, swimming. He gets to the shore. Jesus had a little fire burning. 
and took the fish and he made a lovely breakfast for them. It was a little different fire than another fire that Paul was around in the courtyard, remember? Denying Jesus. This is a different fire that he's around. Three times Jesus asked Peter if he loved him, and three times Peter said yes. Three times Jesus said, feed my sheep. Three times the same amount of times that Peter denied Jesus. Peter was gloriously reinstated, and Jesus said, follow me. Follow me. Now, folks, that is future. That's not past. That's future. Peter, feed my sheep. Peter, follow me. Let's go places. Let's do something exceptional now. Let's learn from regret. Let's pull. Let's squeeze the poison out of it. And let's make something good out of it. Let's put a nice donut pie, or pie filling. Yeah, that'll work too. Put that in there and make it nice and sweet so you can love your regrets. Because of what it has produced in you, Peter. So Jesus didn't take Peter around in the regret cycle. His failure was not fatal. His failure was forward, not backwards. And Peter didn't only re-engage with healthy self-esteem in life, but he re-engaged in productive ministry. In fact, even greater than ever before. It was Peter in Acts chapter 2 who preached boldly on the day of Pentecost. The power came in, the power filled him to overflowing, and the fire of God's presence took hold of his life, and he began to preach with boldness the word of God. And many were saved and baptized that day. That's Acts chapter 2. It was Acts chapter 3. They're on the way to the church for prayer meeting, and there's a lame man by the side of the road. The spot there, and Peter says, I don't have silver, I don't have gold, but in the name of Jesus, stand up and walk, and the lame man gets up. That's Peter. That's the same Peter. Let's go further. Acts chapter 4. Now it's Peter who boldly defends Jesus and his message in court. Whatever it takes, you talk about life transformation. It was Peter who wrote 1st and 2nd Peter in the Bible. In 1st Peter, he wrote to encourage and support Christians who are being persecuted. In 2nd Peter, he wrote to warn Christians against false teachers and false doctrines. I would say that Peter learned to love his regret because he knew it was regret that really made him a power host for Jesus. He realized that what he went through made him what he was today. So he learned to love his regret. Not, not because of what he did. He didn't love what he did, but he loved what it produced. Soren Kierkegaard, the Danish philosopher, I love his quotes. He said, life can only be understood backwards. How many know that? 2020, here it is. 2020, backwards. Life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. Don't you like that quote? Oh, you understand things very well. 2020, hindsight. But you gotta live forward. Just the fact that you're pointed forward. There's no eyes back here. Just the fact that God made you this way. Walking forward means forward motion, man. Get going. There's no eyes back here. Try walking like that, you'll trip and stumble and fall. Your hands are forward, your eyes are forward, your ears are forward, your nose is forward, your mouth is forward. You're on your way. You don't even know it. <laughs> I know it'll mess with your weird meter. That should have been the theme for this fall, messing with your weird meter. But really, it's up to you. It's up to you, it's up to me, it's up to everyone to turn the regrets into something powerful and mighty for Jesus, like Paul did, like Peter did, and like you can do, regardless of what you've done. Oh, the enemy loves to play games to try to mess with your mind, try and tell you you'll be nobody, you can't do nothing, you trip and fall, everything you try to do fails. Get thee behind me, Satan, because I'm going forward with Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together. Thank you, Lord, this morning.
that your word is certainly quick and powerful and mighty. And many times I know in the natural, it doesn't seem like it's workable for us. And there may be some people here this morning that's saying, yeah, but it won't work for me. It will. It will. Just because of maybe a bad decision got you in a mess, a good decision will get you out. Choices. God, I pray for choices that need to be made this morning. I pray, God, for new beginnings that are already happening. People are making fresh commitments before the Lord. In the fall of 2018, they're saying, I've wasted enough years. I've wasted enough time. I've given the devil too much leeway in my life. Now I'm turning it around. I'm going to let God lead and control me. Regardless of how weird it feels, I will let him lead me. I will choose to follow him. I will choose to read God's word. I will choose to believe. I will choose to do. Just as you always have told us, you set before us choices. Choose life. Choose life. Life and death is before us. Choose life. So God, I pray as we make our choices this morning, we look back and say, you know, I've learned to love that regret because of what it produced within me. Made me a better man this morning. Made me a better lady this morning. Made me a better minister for the Lord. Better missionary. Better servant of God. Lord, I desire Romans 8 and 28 to work in every life this morning. And we know that all things work together for good to them who love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. And so, Lord, I pray that we choose this morning. In your wonderful name, we ask it in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing a song. If you're here this morning and you'd like to receive ministry, you'd like someone to pray for you, then step out down the front prayer teams they'll come immediately and begin to pray for your needs